God says in his word, your relationship with me is hinged to your relationship with one another and therefore with one another you should restore with one another you should bear the burden that they shouldn't have to bear the burden alone and when the church becomes that kind of church God shows up in a powerful way to demonstrate his ability to deliver to lift the burden and to restore the life Romans 14 verse 19 says build up one another. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 11 says build up one another. 1 Corinthians 14 26 says build up one another. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 15 and 16 that we are to build up one another. The word is to edify, an edifice, something constructed, something built up. When people come through our doors or when spiritual family comes into your sphere of influence, they are to find themselves being built up by you, not being destroyed by you. And many of us have been in churches that are more known for their tearing down than their building up. And yet the Bible is clear that in the environment of God's family, we are to be construction workers, building something not destructive workers, destroying something. That when people are introduced to the family of God, they're introduced to an environment, or at least they ought to be, that is enhancing and developing their lives under God, not stripping it and destroying it. Now the question is, how is that to be done? There's one key word that tells us how edification, building up one another, is to occur in the family of God. And the fundamental way that, education, that edification occurs between Christians in God's family is by what we say out of our mouths. The scripture read in your hearing, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, building up, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. He ties edification to communication. You edify or not by what you say and how you say it. Now, I know we all have heard the old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That ain't nothing but a lie. There's a whole bunch of folk in here today who've been destroyed by something said to you. Maybe it was a parent who said, you're not going to be anything. You're never going to be anything. You're not going to amount to anything. Maybe it was an employer who told you you're no good. Maybe it was a racial slur that made you self-conscious about your identity. The reality is words do matter because what words you hear affects how you think, feel, and ultimately how you even act. I mean, if a judge comes in and says guilty or innocent, those words matter because they affect your destiny. If a doctor comes in and says benign or malignant, and trust me, those words matter because they affect your well-being. You see, words matter and they can control your well-being or the lack thereof. What you say and how you say it and even when you say it affects whether you are building up or whether you are tearing down. The context here is the one another's. For example, he says in chapter 4, the end of verse 25, we are members of one another. He says in verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other. So he's, he's in a context of one another, but he wants to focus in verse 29 on, on what it means to edify or to build up one another. Because when it comes to giving our communication to God, that's often something we're not willing to do. So important is this issue that the scripture says that our speech reveals our character. 
So if you are a destructive speaker, if you're constantly tearing down, constantly using profanity, constantly gossiping and slandering, the Bible says that's because something is wrong with you on the inside. Your mouth is only revealing your heart. And what you are doing is you are destructing, not constructing, you're tearing down, not building up. And as a result, you are not fulfilling the horizontal, which as you'll see in a moment, will affect how God relates to you in the vertical. Now this is sensitive because it involves our speech and it involves something we do every day. When you look at so many families and how husbands and wives wound each other with how they talk to each other, with what they say to each other. You look at some of the ways that <laughs> words are used to, to unravel people's lives. It becomes clear that what you have in your dentures is dynamite. That there's dynamite in your dentures that when you speak, it is, it is explosive power for good or for bad. You can construct with dynamite or you can destroy with dynamite. And he wants to make sure that you understand that the job of your mouth is to build. The job of your mouth has not been given to you by God to destroy. James chapter three, we'll look at it in a minute, talks about the tongue. He spends 12 whole verses talking about how dangerous the tongue is and how a little member can bring massive destruction. It's a wet place that's, that easily slips. Now the Bible says that when we communicate with each other as Christians, we are to speak the truth with love. Like goalposts. Our words, when we kick them, when we express them, should go through the, these two posts. We are to speak the truth with the other person knowing that we are looking for their well-being. Some people major on the truth. I'm going to tell them the truth. I'm going to tell them what the truth is because they can't handle the truth, but I'm going to tell them just what the truth is. But truth without love becomes dead orthodoxy. It may be true, but there's no life in it. You're speaking death while you may be telling the truth. Conversely, love without truth is empty sentimentalism. It's making me feel good, but I'm no better off for it because you lied to me. See, if you don't tell me the truth, you don't help me. But if you tell me the truth without caring about me, I may know the truth, but I may be worse off for it because I may be more reacting to you than the information you gave me. But if you connect the truth with love, then I get the right information and the right heart. And so you build me up. You don't tear me down, even though it may be negative information you're giving to me because the truth may be designed to correct me, but the love makes me feel like you want to help me. And when I know you're trying to correct me and at the same time trying to help me, I'm being built up by the information you gave me. But if you either don't tell me the truth, so you're making me feel good about something that's not true, or you don't do it in love, so I feel, uh, I, I feel good uh, because uh, I, I got it in love, but I don't know the right information. It's truth and love. Those are the goalposts of communication. And so it is critical that God is able to use our tongues to build up and to not destroy. Proverbs 18, 21 puts it this way that life and death are in the power of the tongue. You can speak life or you can speak death. Unfortunately, husbands regularly speak death to their wives and how they talk to them, the tone in which they speak to them. Wives regularly speak death to their husbands. You're no good, you're nothing, you're never gonna be anything. Parents regularly speak death to their children in the name of Correcting them, they impart death because life and death are in the power of the tongue. The goal of edification through communication, speech, is to build up. 
When people come here or when you relate to them wherever they are, you should be known. We're not perfect. And every word, every time won't be perfect. But what you are to be known as is an edifier, not a destroyer. Here's our problem. Our problem is we're not giving people enough biblically based counseling. We're giving them human opinion. Everybody, I think this, I think that, I think this, I think that, I think you ought to do this, I think you ought to do that. Every time you pick up the phone to get a speck out of your eye to deal with an issue of life and you're talking to people who don't give you God's point of view, that is a wasted conversation. Not if you're trying to deal with an issue, because why? Because the Holy Spirit only uses God's point of view. Do you see what the pastor said? Look at the end of verse 13. It says, I want you to have joy and peace so that you will abound in hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at the end of verse 16. That you will become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Here it is. The Holy Spirit only shows up when there is a good life and the good word. When the life and the word match, the Holy Spirit is is free to marvel, to intervene, to deliver. But if the life and or the word are not matching, there will be no power. So every time you're seeking advice on how to fix your home, on how to be a man, on how to be a woman, on how to be a husband, how to be a wife, how to handle your career, how to handle your money, how will you pick the subject that's a problem in your life and you seek to be delivered by something other than the right life and God's word, there'll be no power. So we're climbing a ladder to reach the top without the Holy Spirit handling the foundation. And the ladder keeps falling over. And we make a New Year's resolution and it falls over. And we promise never to do it again and it falls over. And we were serious. We were serious about that thing. We weren't playing, but the ladder keeps falling over. Why? Because the Holy Spirit wasn't free. He needs the right life with the right word if he's going to show his power. He needs one other thing. If you're going to be a biblical counselor, a neuthetic counselor, and you're supposed to be, every member here is supposed to be able to counsel somebody else. Not at the same level, you may not have been Christian long enough, you may not be mature long enough, but at some level, I mean, if you become a parent at 20, you still have a responsibility to give proper guidance to that child. You're a counselor. You need one other thing. I love the way Paul put it in Acts chapter 20, verse... 31, here's what he says. He says, therefore, being on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one, admonish, pathetic, to admonish each one with tears. Watch this now. Biblical counseling cares about the well-being of the person you're trying to help. Okay, watch this now. You need to have a heart for the person. He says, I, I counseled you with tears. That is, I cared about you. There's got to be the right heart. It can't be, you know, I told you so. It can't be just fulfilling a job description. It's got to come out of a heart that's willing to cry. It says, day and night, I stuck with you. It's got to be with a heart that's willing to hang in there. That's why it's got to be one another. I can't hang in there with, with seven, 8,000 people. But if everybody's hanging in there with somebody, if everybody's admonishing one another, then everybody's getting worked with, walked with, cared for at different levels. You're counseling somebody while somebody's counseling you on another area and, and then somebody's counseling them on another area and one to the other because somebody is caring for somebody else and everybody's being cared for. He says, it was with my heart. He says, I wept over you for three years. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 24 and 25, that we're to help each other with gentleness. 
a surgeon, a surgeon. You see him take a scalpel. He getting ready to cut. He getting ready to hurt you. He getting ready to cut. He's getting ready. You're going to bleed when he finishes with you. He takes the scalpel and he cuts you. But one thing is clear. He's trying to deliver you. If he's a good surgeon, he may have to cut, but he's trying to deliver. It's clear that you're on that table to be delivered, even though it's going to involve a knife. Let me tell you what a good surgeon is not, a slasher. You know, a slash is not trying to correct something, they're trying to kill something. But a surgeon still has to cut, it still may hurt, you still may bleed, but he's trying to deliver. If you're counseling somebody and everybody ought to be one, they ought to, they, it ought to be clear. I'm trying to save something, not trying to hurt something. I'm trying to deliver something. Not trying to, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.14, he is saying, I did not see, say this to shame you. I'm not trying to put you to shame. You may feel shame because of what it is, but I'm not trying to shame you. He says, I do this for your benefit. He says, that's not the motivation behind a biblical counselor. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we got some lazy dudes in that chapter. It says the men don't want to go to work. They want to sleep in. He said, the folks are being busybodies in everybody else's affairs. He says, I want you to admonish them. Counsel that brother to get up and get a job. He says, you, you don't, you don't, he says, you counsel that brother. But he says, treat him like a brother. Remember, he's family. And yes, he needs to be corrected. He can't have a family and be sleeping in. He can't be being lazy, irresponsible. He said, get that brother moving, get that brother up. But remember, he's a brother. It's family. And if he won't respond, then you get tougher with him. But he says, it must be done with this biblical sensitivity. You know why we got to counsel one another? In order to save each other from something going worse. He says, you are to save a brother and you're to save, watch this, his soul from death. He didn't say his body from death. He said his soul from death. Because unless you're physically sick, whatever is wrong with you is located in your soul. Because the soul is your personhood. The body can be physically sick. But if the soul is sick, it is the invisible part of you. That includes the mind, that includes the emotions, that includes the will, and that includes the conscience. All of those make up your soul. The mind, the will, the emotions, and the conscience. Those four things make up your person and personality. If something is wrong in your mental, if something is wrong in your thinking, if something is wrong in your self-control, that's all soul stuff. And that thing may be killing you. It may be destroying you. You can't eat, you can't sleep, can't walk, can't talk. You're, it's just messing you up. You're tossing and turning and it's just killing you. He says, I want you to save a soul from dying. Whether or not their physical body dies or not. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they didn't physically die. But Jesus says, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. They died spiritually. And we're supposed to be, guess what? Saving folk from dying. There's some folk here this morning and you're here, you're sitting in church, but you're just dying. And guess what? Sermons won't, won't do it. Nice songs won't do it. You need the Holy Spirit showing up through people who care enough for you to counsel you based on their life and God's word. A friend is someone who always gets in your way when you're on your way down. That's a friend. You know, when you go to lift weights and you, you may start off real strong, you know? You want to start off real strong. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight and nine. And it gets weighty on you. And you've been knowing what it's like in that weight room to say, help. And 
other words, I can't lift it anymore. And somebody comes alongside your spider, your partner, and he comes and he puts his hands underneath or her hands underneath to help you lift the weight that has gotten too heavy for you to lift. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When life gets so weighty, you can't lift it on your own. Guess what God says? He says, bear one another's burdens. If you see a brother or a sister and life has gotten too heavy for them to lift the weight, don't say I'm praying for you. Don't say I hope you make it. Don't say, well, if you don't make it this time, you'll make it next time. And for God's sake, don't let the weights drop on their neck and destroy them. But if you see them being weighed down by life, weighed down by circumstances, weighed down by sin, he says somebody who's spiritual, come on alongside and help them bear the weight and get it back on the rack. Now, I wish I could come and tell you, follow Jesus and you won't get caught. Follow Jesus and the burden will always be light. But I would be lying to you. And I'm not called to lie to you. Sometimes in life, sometimes even if you're trying to follow Jesus, life gets heavy. Pain gets weighty. People get weighty. Circumstances get weighty. And you are crushing under the weight of it. God says in his word, your relationship with me is hinged to your relationship with one another and therefore with one another you should restore. With one another you should bear the burden that they shouldn't have to bear the burden alone. And when the church becomes that kind of church, not just singing songs and praying prayers and hearing sermons, but when they do this and this, God shows up in a powerful way to demonstrate his ability to deliver to lift the burden and to restore the life. He says, and thus fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? The law of Christ is the law of love. Jesus said, by this shall all men know you're my disciples, that you love one another. And guess what God says in John 4, 1 John 4? He says, and when you love your brother whom you can see, that means you're loving me who you can't see. And when I see you loving me who you can't see, because you're loving the brother who you can see, then you will see much more me. You'll see more. When I see you this way, you'll see a lot more of me this way because now you are fulfilling the law of love. So this is no small thing. Now, 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 now watch where he goes with this. Watch where he goes with this. Verse three and four. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he ain't fooling nobody but himself. He says he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. Okay, let me translate these verses to you in very simple language. You ain't all that. Okay? If you want the Evans paraphrase, the paraphrase is a loose translation let me give it to you in everyday English. You ain't all that. I don't care how good you think you are, how much education you have, what car you drive, where you live, uh, who tailors your suit. Uh, I don't care. God says, don't let a man think he all that. That's why nobody here is too big to serve. Nobody here is too big to care. Nobody here is, too, is, is so high and mighty that when you meet somebody, especially somebody who can do nothing for you in return, who, who has something that the Holy Spirit says, I want you to help release that person, loose that person, or bear that person up. Well, well I'm too big for that. See, that's the problem when when, 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 when people or churches get the big head, you know, they just want to hang out with, with folk like them. Because I want to only hang out with the somebodies. I only want to hang out with the po- folks who've made it. 
because because first Corinthians 1 makes it clear it, it ain't that many mighty not many wise nor is it the rich people of this world whom God has chosen so don't think if you got a little something something you all that and that applies to me that applies to you that applies to us you see on your best day on my best day you know what we are sinners saved by grace that's all that's all you are on your best day Here's the concern. Watch this now, watch this. The concern is, man, I start helping people. I start trying to deliver people, okay? I start trying to bear people's burden. People will use you up. Come on now, tell the truth, shame the devil. People will use you up. You know, especially if they're in your family. They will use you up. They will use, use you up. Uh, I, you know, They'll borrow money for one week because you want to help them out. You want to help them out. They got a financial burden. You help them to bear the burden. But then they're going to come back the next week. They're going to come back the next week. They're going to get mad if you don't keep helping them. No? So, so, so Paul anticipated the concern. He anticipated that, okay, now I know I'm supposed to be spiritual. I know I'm supposed to be used to restore people. I know I'm supposed to be used to help burdens. I know I'm not supposed to think too much of myself. But what about folk using you up? Because you don't have so much energy. You don't have so much time. What about folk messing over you? Knowing you were going to have that question, Paul says in verse 5, for each one must bear his own load. In other words, watch this. You share the burden, but you never take the load. Okay, watch this now. You share the burden, but you never take the load. Let me put it in another way. They must show responsibility if they want your help. If you want me to help you bear the burden, I have to see you doing a little something, something, so you show me you're serious about being responsible. You share the burden, you don't take the load. See, that's why we have this housing crisis. We got this housing crisis because people were able to get mortgages uh, without sharing the load, without putting up anything. You got to show that you're willing to accept responsibility and you're able to share the load as I help you bear the burden. A, a load is smaller than a burden. He says, you don't take that load. So you don't, you don't bear this whole thing on yourself. You, 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 you get a lot, of, a lot of pressure off of you like that. Because all you got to do is tell some folk, let me see what you're coming with first. That'll end that conversation right there. They, they done. They through. You must tether the vertical with the horizontal if you want to see more of God. If you want to see more of God for you, he wants to see more of you with others. If he sees more of you with others, you'll see more of God for you because that's what the church is about. It's not just about sermons and songs. It is about the one another's where we experience God together.
Yeah.